Just the other day, I was looking at my YouTube comments and I saw a comment from a man named Jack. Jack said, I'm a musician. I've been dealing with tinnitus for a number of years and I have a message to share. Today, we are here with Jack Rubinacci, who is a musician and wants to share some important information about tinnitus. Jack, tell us your journey. What's been going on for you with music, noise, and tinnitus? Well, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, you do a great job with the YouTube channel. Been a musician my entire life. Um, started out in bands as a teenager, usual stuff. Became serious about it in my early 20s. Uh, was in lots of bands, lots of loud noise, guitars, drums all the time. Worked very hard with the band that I was in called Honeyman. We were sort of the, the band of the moment in my hometown in Birmingham in England. And uh, developed tennis at 27. Wasn't too bad then. It was sort of a slight noise. And that's when I made my first mistake. I didn't do anything about it. Uh, my tinnitus became sort of much worse when I was 36. I was just doing loads of gigs, recorded two albums, just gigging all the time. No earplugs, which sounds crazy when I think about it now. And when I turned 40, my tinnitus became what I would say chronic. At the time there, there was nobody really talking about it amongst the musicians, at least. Um, I could find a couple of articles from DJs because it's quite a, a bad problem amongst DJs because they have music straight into the headphones. And um, reached out to a couple of guys. They didn't really want to talk about it, apart from this one DJ who sent me a message. He was touring the world, sent me a message saying, if you want to call me, call me. I never bothered him because he was literally, you know, touring the world. But it gave me hope and it made me recalibrate the way I feel about my tinnitus. And that made it more manageable. And even though I have what I would say is chronic tinnitus, I've sort of developed my own tools and techniques to, develop, to sort of deal with it. And I want to share that message specifically amongst people that are new to tinnitus like you do yourself, because you know it's that's the worst you know i think there's three phases we can get into that but i think sharing the message amongst people that are new to it and also amongst musicians there are a lot of musicians that reach out to me because of my books and because of my youtube videos and they say you know it's a scary thing being a musician with tinnitus because it's sort of contradictory you know what I mean? so that's sort of in a nutshell my my journey so far thank you and we're excited to get into the books the message behind the books your own personal experience as a musician before we do that have you studied or learned about other famous musicians and their tinnitus or tinnitus, their ringing in the ears? If we go online, there seems to be reports of very famous musicians and lead singers of bands, lead guitar players of bands who have reported tinnitus. Have you looked into that much or spoken to them? That's the first step that most musicians do. The first thing you do is you look who else has got it. How do they manage it? And even though there's musicians are sort of labeled with having tinnitus they don't really go into it in too much detail on how they deal with it but yes that's that's pretty much the first thing that i would imagine that any musician watching this now with tinnitus is probably the first thing they've done it was certainly one of the first steps i've done and I've, I've gone back to it because one of the things that i think is very important with the journey with tinnitus is to and we can get into this in more detail but to have positive messages coming into your brain and one of the beneficial things of looking at other musicians that do it and manage to do it is that it's giving reaffirming, positive reaffirming message to your brain that you can do it too. And that's sort of what I'm about. With the brain's natural filter mechanism, this limbic system, I equate it to a smoke detector in the kitchen. And if the smoke detector detects a threat, whatever message is it's calibrated for, then it will have a loud auditory response. So if there's smoke in the kitchen, then the smoke detector will have a loud response. Now, what is the signal that's triggering the limbic system to make the tinnitus so loud? If we can understand that brain science, it can help us manage it. Positive messaging is influencing the subconscious emotional processing. So practically, that makes sense. And of course, we would want positive messaging no matter what we're doing. Scientifically, it also has merit based on our understanding of the brain. What have you learned? What are the positive messages you want to share with other musicians, whether they're one year in or one month into louder tinnitus? I think there's three phases to tinnitus. There's the initial shock when you get it. Then you sort of deal with it. You get on with it. You sort of, you look around, you, re you research, you go to the forums, but you probably get to habituation without even realizing what habituation is. Phase two is the worst, in my opinion. It's where you have had habituation, but something has happened. Something has happened to trigger it. And all of a sudden, it's got worse. It's like falling without a parachute. It's absolutely the worst place with tinnitus. And that's where the work that you do and everything that I've said about tinnitus in the past, which is not as much as you, but it's sort of where 
I hope that people pick up on your message and anything that I might say, because stage two is the worst, because you think you could deal with it, but all of a sudden it's got worse. Stage three is where I feel that I am. And that is, is that I've been so many times up and down with tinnitus. I've had it really bad. I've had the habituation. I've lost the habituation. I've just this, just these past few weeks, I've been through a terrible spike. But because I have these tools in place, I'm able to deal with it. And some of the tools that I'm talking about are first and foremost, changing the way you feel about it. If you have a, a small stone in your shoe, when you notice it, it's going to become a problem. If you can't take that stone out immediately, but you just sort of flick it out the way, you can carry on and you don't notice it as much. It's very much about what you're noticing. And I'm so much going through this right now because I've just been through a really bad spike, like really bad, probably the worst I've ever been to. And the way to do it is, well, I think the way to do it is change the way you feel about it. If you think, oh my God, this is really bad, this is really bad, your brain is reaffirming what you're thinking and what you're feeling and it's become, gonna become worse. If you can get to a point which is where stage three is, where I, I feel I am, you say, well, yeah, it's there. I've been here before. It's going to be okay. Just by saying to yourself, it's going to be okay, already takes 50% off your shoulders. You say, I've been here before. I can relax into this. I know that within a few weeks, it's going to get better. Within a few months, it's going to get even better. It's not going to go away, but I'm going to change the way I feel about it. That to me is such it's the first foundation of getting over tinnitus and it's the first tool in my book because I feel that if you get to that point, you're already 50% there. Other things that I would say, you know, without going specifically into musicians, but as a whole, people with tinnitus, if you can change the things around the tinnitus, we can't change the central thing, which is tinnitus. It's there and we can't change that right now. What we can change is things around it. So what does that mean? It means, okay, changing the way I feel about it. Already I feel better because I know it's there but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go against it. I'm going to work with it. I'm just going to let it go. Second thing would be exercise. Can I do exercise that sort of makes me feel better? Endorphins into the brain, I'm feeling better. Third thing would be food. I've changed my some of the food that I eat, breakfast in particular, because it makes me feel stronger. If I can find ways to, to sort of centralize my core and feel stronger about life in, in general, I can deal with this thing. Because what happens is the bigger these things become, my focus on food, my focus on energy, my focus on reducing stress, which is a huge thing, man. Reducing stress is massive. I know it's not very easy, but it's fundamental. And I think that if we see ourselves as people with tinnitus, because a lot of the time people that approach me, they say, you know, I'm a musician or whatever, I've got this thing. And I say, if you address yourself as someone with tinnitus, you are identifying yourself as someone with tinnitus, I therefore need to change things around my tinnitus. Do you understand why I think identifying yourself as someone with tinnitus is really important because you say, I have tinnitus, I therefore need to change these things around. So exercise, stress, because reducing stress is not easy. But if you say, hey, hold a minute, I'm a person with tinnitus. I've got to find ways of reducing, tests, uh, um, reducing stress. If there are people in my life that are toxic, can I reduce that engagement that I have to have with these people so that my stress levels are lower? Can I find ways to reduce my stress? All these things, sometimes when you talk about these things to people with tinnitus, they say, but I, I sort of, that's not what I'm thinking. I just want to get rid of tinnitus. Well, my message is, if you can change these things around tinnitus, your diet, exercise, reduce stress, find distractions, massive, massive thing. I, I was on holiday in Greece about three or four years ago, and it took me two or three days to remember that I have tinnitus, and I have pretty bad tinnitus. And that was a big turning point for me, because I was like, hold on a minute, I haven't thought about my tinnitus for two or three days distractions find things you love and do more of them because the more you do it the more you enjoy yourself the more you are forgetting this ridiculous noise in our brain i really feel that these things changing things around tinnitus they don't get rid of tinnitus but they strengthen the core and help us not just become overcoming tinnitus but help us reduce the tinnitus by strengthening our core and i think also help with help us become healthier people as a whole Absolutely. You're bringing up great points. Myself coming from the scientific lens where I'm thinking is, okay, you're working on some frameworks of cognitive behavioral framework, right? The cognitive behavioral techniques or framework. So cognition is the mind. What kind of messaging am I letting come into my mind? How am I responding to the thinking, the automatic thoughts, some of which may be negative? How can I replace those with more truthful, scientific, realistic thinking. And then the behavioral part of this is, 
what kind of behaviors am I doing? Am I reinforcing that tinnitus is negative, bad, this dark cloud? Or am I changing? Am I modifying? Bringing in the holistic perspective is a great way to you know, accelerate those behavior changes for tinnitus. One thing I say to a lot of my telehealth patients is that the way to treat this condition is through managing it. Through managing it, it becomes treated, right? There is no cure, but there is treatment option. So the way to get to that point is by doing everything you're doing, the psychological, the sound therapy, the holistic. I wanted to bring us back. What was your timeline when it became louder? Was it sudden or was it gradual with the loud noise exposure? It, it, it varied. So between 36 and 39, it was lot, lots of gigs. So it was, I was noticing it more and more. I'd come home from shows and my head would sort of hum and it'd okay. be hot and I could realize that I could notice that my tenses were getting worse. But then on the 16th of November, 2000, 17th of November, 2016, I was editing a video that had a particular noise in it and I went out to do a show at the end of the day. And that's the next day was, you know, the next three weeks were terrible because it was a huge spike. I had some shows to do at the time as well. So I found that my spikes have occurred after an incident. And the interesting thing is that I'm not quite sure whether it was all because of the sound or whether it was a combination of the sound and the reaction mentally to the sound. That's why I really feel, and I know that you you say a lot of this in your videos, that the state of mind is so important with us. And it's actually so interesting to see how my state of mind changes, the level of my tinnitus or the burden of my tinnitus reduces. So this is why it's so fundamental, I think, to try and find ways to adjust your state of mind. So yeah, so if, uh, if several spikes happened after sound. Yeah, I had another patient who was a touring musician for years and has chronic tinnitus relatively managed and we met and one of the points of confusion for them was because I have tinnitus and it's chronic does that mean I'm not supposed to play music anymore right and after our conversation I determined hey you're medically cleared to rock just make sure you're using the right kind of earplugs the cells the stereocilia that inner hair cells, the outer hair cells of the cochlea, the hearing organ, that is the biological marker of hearing loss, noise-induced hearing loss, right? Having tinnitus does not mean those cells are at any higher risk of damage. So this is a big point that musicians especially uh, need to be reminded of, is that having tinnitus is neurological, damage to the hearing organ that is biological or physiological. So tinnitus can change up and down, spikes, get better, resolved, habituated, come back a little bit. And that's related, but independent to the cells of the cochlea. How, how do you use earplugs and do you still play shows? Just to reply to that point, one of the questions that I get asked a lot, I get a lot of musicians approach me and one of the questions they say is, do you have hearing loss? And I find myself repeating this answer over and over again. I say, no, I hear like a dog. So I actually don't have hearing loss. And a, a lot of other musicians are in the same position. They don't, they have tinnitus, but they don't have hearing loss. So it's an interesting point. And the way I, an, another way of dealing with state of mind is the way I feel about it is that as long as I can hear, I can work. Because mm -hmm. if you can't hear, that changes the dynamic. But I can hear so I can work. And the idea that I can work makes me feel happier and the, and the size of tinnitus. All these things reduce the size of tinnitus so that it's smaller. So yeah. yes, I wanna, that's I wanna a very add, interesting point. I want to add something to that is that from studying with the founder of TRT, Paul Jasperoff, one important point of, of those trainings, of those mentor programs, was that even if the hearing is in the normal range on a typical audiogram test, 250 to 8,000 hertz, if we're testing the outer hair cell function of the cochlea with a test called the OAE test, autoacoustic emission, it's a specific test on how those cells are operating. And for majority of people with tinnitus, vast majority, the test shows that those cells are not in the normal range. They're slightly abnormal. And definitely as a musician, we can expect if there's been 5, 10, 20 years of loud music, something's got to give. So those cells are sensitive and you're not hearing how you used to 20 years ago. So I think this can also be a point that's confusing is doctors tell me my hearing's normal, but I still have tinnitus. This is not normal. Well, going deeper and more fine grained and audiology clinics can do this test. We can see, oh, okay, if we're going deeper into the physiological marker of this, it's not what it used to be. 
Now that's not to say this makes everything better, but it is one small piece of the puzzle because tinnitus can be somewhat of a mystery, right? It's confusing. Doctors tell you there's not many options. You're going online trying to figure it out. So anything, anytime that we can take away that mystery or that confusion, it has that positive benefit too. Yeah. I'm um, getting back to your point with earplugs. I'm very, very proactive with earplugs. Uh, and I'm very, very sort of proactive with telling other people about earplugs. Uh, it's still, when I, when I was in bands back in the late 90, early 90s, when I was really working quite a lot with bands, the knowledge that we had was general. So that you got knowledge from the bass player, the sound man, we didn't have such access to the internet. So we didn't talk about it. So no one took action. Nobody had earplugs. Uh, and that was a huge mistake because we rehearsed in a room the size of a shoebox and it was very loud. Four guys, drums, guitars. And when I think back to my experiences with music and all the gigs I've done with no earplugs, it scares me now to see musicians still. It's very, very better now. A lot of musicians were in there monitoring and earplugs, but there are still lots of musicians not wearing earplugs. And, it, you know, I don't bring this up, but I feel emotional about it. I'm like, I wish that you knew just how important it is to wear earplugs. It doesn't change the experience of the music because there's there's different schools of thought with musicians. They say, I need to hear it to feel it. I don't have that option anymore because my tinnitus is so loud. So I've trained my brain again. It's about adapting to your new situation. I've trained my brain to be able to hear less because of the earplugs, but to perform more. So the way I deal with earplugs is I have earplugs on all my sort of situations. I have them on my car keys. I have them in my wallet. I have silicon molded earplugs in my wallet. They're the ones I use the most, most minus 30 dB. Uh, I have minus 30 dB silicons on my mixing desk. And then when I do shows, I have a thing that's called Hunter's earplugs, which are minus 36, minus 37, which is getting towards the maximum you can attenuate because your, your cranium attenuates at minus 30, I'm a, a, a led to believe. And you can only attenuate to a certain point. So minus 36, minus 37 is what I think is the limit. And these are pretty much that. And what they are is they're a lump of silicon molded to my ears so that I can sing and I can uh, protect my ears with the absolute maximum. And you just learn to change, you know, train your brain to not have to hear at loud volumes, but still be able to sing and perform at a high level. It's not easy, but it's a bridge that once you cross, it's a, you know, it sort of keeps me in the game. Absolutely, totally necessary. And what did that take a few weeks, a few months? How long did it take to adapt to that? Yeah. It it took a few, a good few shows. So a few weeks, uh, okay. the first thing you want to do is take them out. Okay, um, good. Yeah, but you okay, just good. Yeah, yeah, our message to musicians, younger musicians, especially even younger festival goers or concert goers, that was me. I was, you know, there first few rows, dancing, having fun, oh, yeah. no earplugs, probably didn't do all that much, but cumulatively it can have a big impact, especially for younger musicians who are playing live. What I wanted to share was that noise exposure creates a has a delayed effect of hearing loss. So to have decades of noise exposure, you're likely not to experience hearing loss until you're 40 or 50 years old. What we typically see is that people start to lose their hearing as a society between 60 and 70 years old. About that time, for someone who's had loud noise exposure, whether that's music, military, hunting, industrial, that hearing loss is likely to show between age 50 and 60. So there's this delayed effect. And that's why you can be touring for decades and your hearing test is normal. You're experiencing some tinnitus and we'll typically follow that trend over time. So make sure to get your hearing tested. And as you're doing, as you're doing, Jack, be proactive about it. This has been an excellent conversation and perhaps we will speak again. I really value what you're bringing here to our community by volunteering your time. Tell us where people can find your books and any last messages you have for our community. Last message is you will be okay with tinnitus. It's something you can deal with. I think it's very important to share that message because I've sort of been at all levels with tinnitus at the start. I've been very bad with tinnitus and I'm still here. I'm still rocking. I'm still writing. I'm still recording. So that's sort of the message I'd like to share with everybody. Books, jetrubinacci.com. Uh, they're on Amazon, Kindle, and paperback. And I also have a website called helpmytinnitus.com, helpmytinnitus.com, uh, that shares information about me and my journey and uh, the sort of the points that I've been talking about today. I want to say thank you for having me on the show. You have a fantastic YouTube channel with a lot of good information. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Jack. And for anyone listening, make sure to check out our other podcast episodes. We'll see you next time. Thank you.